Welcome to the IVF Journey with Dr. Michael Chapman, the podcast for couples who struggle with infertility and want to fulfill their dreams of becoming parents. In this podcast, you'll learn actionable strategies to deal with infertility from Dr. Michael Chapman, or Prof as he's affectionately known. Prof is the co-founder of IVF Australia and is a leading Australian infertility specialist who has helped over 3,000 couples realise their dreams of becoming parents. To access previous episodes packed with ideas, solutions and tips that actually work, head over to Dr. Chapman's IVF podcast on iTunes. You can also ask questions by contacting Dr. Chapman's rooms on 1800 111 483 or by emailing him michael.chapman at ivf.com.au. That first cry of a baby born after the long journey of IVF remains one of the most beautiful experiences in the world. As an obstetrician and an IVF specialist, I've had the privilege of experiencing this over many thousands of times in my long career, but I still remain moved by each baby's first cry. It signifies the end of a long journey and the beginning of a new life. This is Professor Michael Chapman, co-founder of IVF Australia and host of the IVF Journey podcast. Thanks for tuning in. To access all the previous episodes, head over to my website, www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu. You'll also be able to find the various services that we provide at IVF Australia. So today we're going to talk about fibroids and infertility. Are they important or are they not? What can be done about them? and what not, what's worth leaving alone. So, let's start with what fibroids are. Fibroids are overgrowth of the muscle of the uterus. So the muscle of the uterus is called the myometrium, and so the technical name for a fibroid is a myoma. Now, we don't know what causes them. We know they're common. In women, they occur in about 30% by the time a woman gets to the age of 35. In some racial groups, they're more common. Afro-Caribbeans, for instance, it's nearly 50% of women by the time they're 35 have fibroids. So these balls of muscle grow within the uterus can be a problem in pregnancy, both in conceiving, holding the pregnancy, and ultimately in delivering a baby. The ones that are important are the ones that are inside the uterus because they can be in various positions of the uterus. The vast majority, in fact, are on the outside. They're called subserosal fibroids. And some of them can even be on stalks sticking out from the uterus. They're called pedunculated fibroids. And they're harmless and they don't do anything to pregnancy in any way. The ones that are subserous certainly can grow in pregnancy but are rarely a problem. The only problem that fibroids can cause during a pregnancy once it's established, they can grow and outgrow their blood supply and therefore break down or undergo what's called necrosis. The other name uh, that's been given to it is called red degeneration. If that happens, and I said it's very rare, when it does happen, however, it causes quite severe pain and can require hospitalization and and pain relief, but it does go away. Occasionally it can trigger premature labor. So we talked about the subserosal ones. Underneath that, into the uterus itself, into the uterine wall, there are ones called intramural fibroids within the wall. Again, they're not particularly important from stopping pregnancy or causing miscarriage, but they can grow in pregnancy like the ones on the outside. They grow in pregnancy because of estrogen. Estrogen drives their growth. The ones that are most important from an infertility perspective and miscarriage perspective are those that are beneath the lining of the womb. They're called 
submucosal fibroids, and they can cause problems with implantation of an embryo and also in causing miscarriage. Why does that happen? Well, it's because that myoma, that myoma tissue is abnormal in terms of its blood supply and the lining of the womb that sits on top of it is not a normal endometrium. It doesn't allow the blood vessel growth that's required to implant a pregnancy or to maintain a pregnancy uh, as it grows along. So the evidence is quite clear now that submucosal fibroids do reduce fertility and do increase the miscarriage rate. It doesn't mean you can't have a normal pregnancy with them there. It just reduces the chances because uh, an embryo can attach over the normal lining of the womb in the rest of the womb. It's only that area over that fibroid that's a problem. So what do we do about fibroids? As I've said already, most fibroids, the ones on the outside of the uterus and even those in the wall, probably have no impact on fertility or miscarriage unless they're exceptionally large. Doctors who wish to undertake removal of fibroids as their main expertise, this is particularly so amongst laparoscopic surgeons, there are some real experts at doing these through keyhole surgery. I, uh, I'm concerned operate for the sake of operating, not for the sake of improving your fertility chances. They would argue that fibroids can grow and you don't know what's going to happen to them, but uh, a myomectomy is not an insignificant procedure. The risk of a myomectomy is that when it's removed, bleeding occurs, and that bleeding, if it was uncontrolled, could lead to the need to have a hysterectomy. It's very rare for that to get to that point, but certainly something in the order of one in a hundred myomectomies ends up like that. And obviously, if you end up without a uterus, your childbearing days are over. So I'm certainly not an advocate of seeing a fibroid and taking it out, unless it's a submucosal fibroid. The submucosal fibroids, if they are indenting the cavity of the uterus, can be removed or at least their size dramatically reduced by an instrumental removal of the surface of those going through the neck of the womb and into the cavity of the uterus without having to a need for an open operation. So myometrial resection is an option in those situations. However, it often means the whole fibroid isn't removed and they can grow again. Only today I've had a case exactly of that. Nine months ago, a woman had resection of a fibroid and then she had a scan last week after a heavy period and unfortunately it's regrown. So now we're talking about a full myomectomy with laparoscopic surgery. The surgical approach using keyhole surgery is very successful. It obviously leaves scarring in the uterus where the fibroids were. Uh, what's left behind is, is muscle, but that muscle has to heal and scarring can occur and potentially weaken the uterus for labor. And most people, most obstetricians, uh, when a woman's had a myomectomy, will suggest a um, caesarean section rather than allow a normal labor for risk of rupturing the uterus. What else can we do about fibroids? Well, there have been drugs uh, developed that, that may suppress them. As I said earlier, they are dependent on estrogen. And so if we switch off estrogen, which we can do with six months of injections uh, of a, a drug called Zolidex, we make your body think that it's going through the menopause, the pseudomenopause. What we do know is that fibroids shrink after the menopause. The problem with it is that within 12 months after that, the fibroids will have begun to regrow. So it's not necessarily a long-term solution. There's a new drug on the market called Esme, which is supposed to be better than the agonist and it doesn't give the menopausal symptoms. Uh, however, in the last days, the European Drug Authority have issued a warning since uh, there have been a, 
two or three cases of women developing liver failure. So it's not without its potential risks. And while it helps some women to reduce the size of their fibroids, it's by no means universal. So fibroids do have an impact on fertility and miscarriage if they are just under the surface of the lining of the womb. The evidence suggests that other fibroids probably don't make much difference. What we do know is that fibroids keep on growing until menopause. And certainly I've had to remove fibroids in women, not for fertility purposes, but for just the pressure symptoms of giant fibroids. I've done one procedure now 15 years ago on a woman uh, aged 45, and we had to make the incision from just under her chest all the way down to the pubic bone because the fibroid weighed seven kilos. She was seven kilos lighter when I'd finished the procedure and she had quite significant pressure symptoms from it, not surprisingly. But that's an exception. They usually are in the order of centimetres is the standard. But if you do have fibroids and you are having trouble getting pregnant, see a specialist who understands about fibroids, not necessarily a general gynaecologist who enjoys operating because you may be having an operation that's unnecessary. That's my warning. And don't forget that you can access all the previous episodes by going to our website www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu. Thank you for listening to the IVF Journey with Dr. Michael Chapman, the podcast which helps couples negotiate their way through the IVF Journey all the way to parenthood. You can also ask questions by contacting Dr. Chapman's rooms on 1800 111 483 or by emailing him michael.chapman at ivf.com.au.